We didn't approve that in the last budget. That was in the capital request. All right. Good afternoon. I call to order the October 2022 meeting of Finance and Operations Committee of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. I want to thank everyone who is joining us via the live stream video and those attending in the boardroom or via Zoom. Let me first welcome our student representatives for today, Gabriel Richardson, who I believe is appearing by Zoom. Is that correct? Or we're working on that. Gabriel, if you're there, we're working on it. And Nicholas Wallenhorst, who is here in, around the horseshoe with us. They're both from the Twin Cities campus, and I welcome both of you. I'm going to use my prerogative today as chair and do a bit of reordering so we can get to our action items first, and then have plenty of time for our information items, uh, particularly the information technologies discussion. So as a consequence, we're going to take up the consent report first, followed by items one and two, and then we will turn to item four, which is a review and action of the resolution related to the amended restated operating agreement of 2407 University Investment LLC. After we clear away our action items, we will return to item three, our discussion of key cost drivers of a system-wide information technologies, and then we will finish with the information items. So at this time, I want to move to the consent report, uh, and I'm going to, uh, which is item number five on your agenda uh, of the revised consent report. So with that, uh, Senior Vice President Franz, will you summarize the items in today's revised consent report? Yes, thank you, Chair Mayron and members of the committee. The October consent agenda includes three purchases of goods and services, two capital budget amendments, and three schematic designs. Among the purchases represented for approval, I'd like to bring your attention to the license renewal of Kaltura, Kaltura for system-wide support of our media management tool. As Vice President Golicek will highlight in his key cost drivers presentation today, this purchase continues the operation of the digital learning environment by making course video recordings available to students as part of their instruction. This is an excellent example of how information technology can contribute to learning successes by integrating with existing tools. Kaltura allows our faculty and staff to produce their own video content that can directly link into Canvas, our online teaching platform. I'd also like to point out that there was a third capital budget item for the renovation of the Variety Club Research Center in the Health Sciences District on the Twin Cities campus on the East Bank. We received a request from that unit to pull this request from the docket. There have been some recent changes in the direction and objectives of that space that require us to take more time to confirm the scope and the purpose of that amendment. Uh, those are the ones that I would highlight, Madam Chair. All right, thank you very much. Is there anyone that would like to ask a question, make a comment, or separate an item out from the report to be voted on separately before I invite a motion to recommend approval of the revised consent report? All right, hearing none, is there a motion to recommend approval of the revised consent report? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. Thank you very much. At this time, I'm going to make sure I move to the right place here. We're going to uh, item number one, which was the president's recommended fiscal year 2024-25 biennial budget request. Uh, and at this time, I would ask President Gable, Senior Vice President Franz, and Vice President Tonneson, who are here to present on the recommendation. President Gable, would you like to start us off? Yes, thank you, Chair Mayron, Vice Chair Hipsch, and members of the committee. At the September meeting, we presented to you for review the university's biennial budget request to the state. 
of fiscal year 24-25, and today we bring that proposal to you for action. The priorities we've highlighted broadly reflect our commitments through MPAC 2025 and beyond, the pivots we've made, and then our stewardship for our mission and our institution's 170 years of legacy. And with that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to SVP Franz and VP Tonneson to walk us through. All right, Vice Pre Senior Vice President Franz. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, President Gable. Uh, let's go ahead and bring up the, uh, the first slide, I th uh, and only slide. Um, <laughs> sorry, Julie, um, didn't want to upset you there. So uh, we wanted to double back here because this is the slide that really highlights the, the different components of the, the biennial budget request. Uh, as you know, this coming year, 2023, is a biennial budget year at the state level uh, and the Governor and legislature are charged with reaching a budget agreement uh, by June 30, 2023. And uh, this will be our request that will go to the governor's office. It will go, I believe it will be submitted on Monday uh, to the to Minnesota Management Budget. Uh, we, we put a lot of work in this and, and uh, I'm gonna have uh, Vice President Tonneson walk through the components to remind everyone of the different ways that we've got to these numbers, and we look forward to any questions you might have. Vice President Tonneson, if that's okay, Madam Chair. Thank you. Vice <clears throat> President Tonneson. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee, and happy to be here this afternoon and for what I hope is a positive and, and happy topic for us. Uh, I am going to summarize for you our recommended biennial budget request for FY24 and FY25, that's the next biennium. And if you approve it today and tomorrow, we will move forward really in two ways uh, for the request. First, and this isn't on this slide, but I want to just mention it briefly, we will request continuation of our current base operating appropriations outside of the state's general fund. So we get $22,250,000 from the cigarette tax annually, and we get $2,157,000 from the health care access fund annually. And those are the base numbers we will simply ask for continuation at that level. Remember that the base funding is the amount of the appropriation that will continue into the next biennium unless <coughs> the state takes action to increase it or decrease it. So we're simply saying please continue it at that level. The second piece then that we will move forward with is on this slide and that is to act, ask the state to take action to increase our general fund appropriation. So as you see at the top of this slide, our base appropriation annually today from the general fund is $689.3 million. That is what will continue unless the state takes action. And we are asking them to increase it in three different change items. So I'll summarize those for you briefly and they are on this slide. The first is we are asking for a $45 million increase in year one and then another, on top of that, $45 million increase in year two of the biennium. That is for our core mission support. You might remember from the September conversation that we proposed a partnership on this core mission support. That's based on our current estimates of a projected $90 million increase in annual expenditures for our general operations. And our proposal then for the partnership is for the state to cover half of that, of that projected increase and the university would cover the other half of the projected cost increase through a combination of, of things, through tuition revenue gains, through growth in other revenues as appropriate, and through internal spending reductions which produces a redistribution of existing resources to new costs. Support of our core mission and why we need this means that they would be supporting all of the various types of instructors we have and the supplies for teaching. They would be supporting the faculty and the staff and the equipment and the supplies for research and outreach. It would be support for student services. It would be support for our facility operating costs and our technology infrastructure, things that enable our work and really enhance our work, and it would support things like public safety and compliance requirements that benefit our students, our employees, and the public. So that is the first change item, the first thing that we would be requesting, the 45 million each year for core mission. Then there are two change items that are related to and fall from our 
proposal to carry forward three of the top operating priorities from last year's supplemental budget request. The first change item in this category involves two programs for student aid specifically. So we're asking for, in this one, a $10 million annual increase starting in FY24 with no growth in the second year for the Promise and Promise Plus program. You know, as you remember, that the Promise program is our primary aid, university supported need-based aid program. And what we would do in, with this $10 million is increase the in maximum income eligibility threshold for, for the programs from 120,000 to 140,000 for the Promise program and from 50,000 to 60,000 for the Promise Plus program. In addition to that, we would increase the individual aid amounts for the students that are currently receiving Promise Awards. The second component of this student aid piece is for a, to implement a new Greater Minnesota Scholarship Program aimed at Minnesota resident undergraduates attending our Crookston, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester campuses. This program would really be designed to recruit them to stay in Minnesota with significant awards in year one, and then to retain them through to graduation with slightly less but still meaningful awards in years two through four. Now this change item, this $30 million increase for student support, we are in developing it and bringing it forward, we are acknowledging that the state support for the University of Minnesota is a key priority component in the way that we can manage costs for students. Different from philanthropy, and philanthropy is another key priority way that we can address the cost burden for students, but different from philanthropy, if this particular change item is funded, this $30 million, it will allow us to target state support to those students with the greatest financial need and to Minnesota resident undergraduate students. And then finally, the third change item is for $5 million for an enhancement of public safety system-wide, addressing needs now that we would not be able to do without additional state funding. This $5 million will allow us on the Twin Cities campus to add security officers, expand our ability to implement overtime patrol shifts, and invest in smaller things like our canine units and uh, trailers for cameras and, and so forth. The larger piece of this is a system-wide initiative to replace outdated cameras, security equipment, and building access controls, and to fund the required technology and employees necessary to manage and run these systems on an ongoing basis. So in summary, we believe this full request, this $80 million in year one, and an incremental growth over that of $45 million in year two, speaks to what we really need right now at this point in time. It would allow us to build successful budgets for FY24 and FY25 to maintain the excellence that we have worked really hard uh, to achieve and also to support the momentum that we've developed in a lot of areas, um, growth areas. The total annual general fund appropriation leaving the next biennium, so that means the FY25 appropriation moving forward as the base into the next biennium would be $814.3 million if this is fully funded. And that would compare to the $689.3 million as we're leaving the current biennium. And with that, Madam Chair, that concludes my remarks. We uh, respectfully request approval of our recommendation and are happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Vice President Tonneson. Before we move to discussion, is there a motion to recommend approval of the resolution related to the state biennial budget request for fiscal year 2024-2025? So moved. Is there a second to this motion? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Uh, Excuse yeah. me, AXME is here on union business. We are interrupting your meeting at this time. Who are we? We are AXME union workers. We are here to speak on behalf of over 2,000 of your employees. We do the on-the-ground work that must be done to keep this university operating smoothly. 
We provide health care for our local university and Twin Cities community as nurses, dental care providers, and veterinary <coughs> care workers. Research animal management at RER, collections management at our libraries and more technical services. Department operations as clerical workers, like coordinating and scheduling classes, faculty meetings, research, interviews, entering student information, including grades, finance processing, and supervising student workers, just to name a few of our responsibilities. Why are we here? We're interrupting your Board of Regents meeting because the university bargaining team has said to us that rather than taking our concerns to them at the table, as is our right and is their responsibility, we have to talk to you directly to move forward on our demands. These demands include a wage increase that keeps up with inflation, a commitment from the university that Juneteenth is made a holiday for staff, as the university promised in its racial equity proposals, but still refuses to agree to at the table. A pay augmentation for workers who offer bilingual translation services as a function of their job. A commitment to the right for native workers, the egregiously few of them that are employed here, to take paid time off to vote in tribal elections, in addition to other standing commitments to protect the voting rights of our other members. A rhetorical question for you, why do we do land acknowledgments here if the university isn't willing to agree to basic participation in tribal politics? What does this mean to me personally? In my role at the university, I work for a supervisor I admire. I adore my students, my fellow staff and faculty, inspire me daily. I work hard and long hours to bring in one of the most diverse and one of the most highly educated dental classes to date. In addition, I brought in a record 846 international dental student applications resulting in $126,500 in application fees alone this year. That is more than twice my salary. Does the university think that positions like mine are valuable? Let's see, the university devalued my job classification more than $12,000 since 2007. What does that tell you? To add insult to injury, between last year and this year, I took a pay cut. The university proposed a 1.5% wage
through the process of negotiations with the university to reach a, a just resolution for everyone. That's my hope in any event. Moving on at this point now to our business. Uh, what I would like to do is call on regents who may have items of discussion or <clears throat> questions for any of our presenters. We'll start with Regent Sviggum. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm very supportive of the <clears throat> president's request here. Um, but I have one question, if I could. Uh, suppose in the past, I'm trying to remember when we requested a lot of the state and got little, or a little of the state and got little. Which works best for us? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chair Is that a rhetorical question, or do you really <laughs> want her to answer <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in seeing what the answer would be, but no, she doesn't, she doesn't have All to right. respond. But I, uh, I do have one question. Suppose uh, in the request here uh, of the $30 million for the scholarship programs, um, if, if I'm a state legislator sitting over in St. Paul here, Tell me why I would give this 30 million to this Promise Scholarship or the Greater Minnesota Scholarship, rather than just put it into the state grant program, which the legis which I'm in charge of. Why, why would I take that 30 million and put it here as opposed to state grant program for all students in the state? Vice President Tonneson, do you want to take a stab at responding? Sure, I would be happy to. Uh, Chair Mayron, Regent Sveigum, I would say that we are looking at how to benefit our students, the University of Minnesota students, and want to target that state support specifically in those two ways. Broadly expanding into the middle income category of students by raising the income threshold, and then focusing on Minnesota students with that uh, really unique, I think, and customized scholarship program to get them to stay in Minnesota and to retain to graduation. The state grant program, as you are aware, covers students regardless where they go to school, private, public, uh, two-year, four-year, and so forth. Uh, and so it isn't targeted in the same way as we could propose for our students. Yeah. Uh, Senior Vice President Franz. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Vice President Tonneson. And uh, Regents Figum, I think one of the keys that uh, Vice President Tonneson mentioned was the idea of targeting. And one of the things that, to the extent we can target our resources to Minnesota students and make it more affordable for those students that need that help based on the income levels, but also this helps bring out underrepresented students and bring, give them an opportunity to be part of our campus, as well as middle income students. So it really is, in our way, underscoring and supporting the, the Minnesota student population we have, which is what, about 70% of our uh, mm -hmm. mission this last year. So it, the idea is to target the Minnesota students that need the money the most. Is that fair, Vice President? Mm -hmm. I didn't. Oh. Any response? Regent well, I, I just think the response is exactly the reason why we have the Minnesota State grant, grant and Scholarship Program. It's Minnesota students and it's targeted uh, by income. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to be devil's advocate. I'm just saying if I'm in control, you know, I would, uh, why wouldn't I put it in the state? If I had that 30 million, and I'm not sure if they have it, but they have 9 billion, I think. <laughs> uh, but I would probably be looking at uh, doing it for all students targeted the same way that you responded. It is targeted. Thank you. Uh, any further response by the administration or I'll move on to Regent Rosha. I would just like to say, Chair Mayron, Regent Sviggum, I would advocate for both an increase in the state grant program <laughs> and our, our proposal. Okay. All right, Regent Rosha. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Chair Mayron. Um, to Regent Sviggum's first uh, question, having, well, I think is this my seventh or eighth biennial budget uh, discussion? And um, the answer is, when we have tried to ask for a, uh, a more modest increase of high, uh, high need um, uh, matters, uh, the legislature has uh, simply taken our request and our uh, um, neighbor systems request and given us each a percentage of it, and in which case we, we lost out. We had less than if had we asked for the larger amount. Um, and so 
a large request, you know, it, it tends to have a gravity to it. And so in the past, I have um, been a strong supporter of large requests of the state, not because I necessarily think that, that among all the things the legislature has to um, evaluate that we are the, 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 the greatest need or highest priority, but I believe strongly that <clears throat> the role of the legislators is to make those decisions. And so I want to, oh, you know, never wanted, we, there were times where we asked for less than we thought we needed, and I think that's a mistake because then you can hardly hold the legislature responsible for failing to give it to you because you didn't even ask for it. So I've always been of the mind that asking for a, you know, a, a large um, uh, amount of support from the state let legislators do their jobs, and they can they can pick that out. So I've always, you know, I've, I've always been a strong supporter of of uh, strong requests um, and, and laying out our needs in front of the state and let the legislators make that decision. Now, um, I am disappointed, and this goes to your your second point. I'm disappointed that the Promise Scholarship. I I, I don't agree uh, on on the Promise Scholarship concept um, because it's it's a essentially it's progressive taxation you know, within the university. You're pitting one student against another. I'd much rather it go to the grant and aid program, although I, I'm always concerned. Of, the, the re, part of why the, <clears throat> the grant and aid program is there, there's a long history with the privates and access to that money and so on, but um, you know, when, when the legislature has seen the public institutions not holding the line on tuition, they've decided that they're going to find a way to make it affordable to students and take that decision out of the hands of the university. And, and this, is, this takes us another step down that road. Um, but you know, it's the purview of the state to conduct progressive taxation. Um, we are taxing students on money that is earned by or received by a third party, meaning a parent or a guardian. We don't know that the student actually has access to that money. We don't know what other financial op, you know, obligations that family has, and so ultimately we're pitting a student against a student. By putting this money in, a, in an internal need-based, you know, quote unquote, um, program, um, we are we are literally charging student A tuition to make it more affordable for student B, and in reality, student B actually might have access to more resources than student A. I think that's the that's the state's responsibility. Um, I, I I'm less concerned about you know the the the, the Greater Minnesota uh, the scholarship is I mean when you really think about it, it's really just a differential tuition rate for resident versus non-resident because it's money that goes to resident students that doesn't go to non-resident students. And on our system campuses, we'd be much better off putting that money into re reducing tuition. Because when you have, it's one thing if, if those campuses are full, but when the campuses are not full and the marginal cost of, of educating a non-resident is below what the tuition they'd pay uh, would be, we want to attract as many non-residents as we possibly can. And for so many families, they see that sticker price, they don't even get to the, the discussion about whether there's aid available and so on. And so I think that that, that money is much better uh, spent on keeping tuition low. As, as I stated at the last meeting, the best financial aid is low tuition. Um, again, progressive taxation is the, is the job of the state, not the job of the university. Um, and that st uh, aid, student aid is the job of the state through the grant and aid program, and it's the, the job of private philanthropy, uh, such as through our foundation. That's where that should be coming from. This is, a, this is a, a slippery slope, dangerous road to go down. I think it's an unfortunate policy, and for that reason, and because it's so prominent in this uh, proposal, I'm not going to support the, the request. Thank you. Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, my main question was actually answered in the docket materials. Go figure. Um, so I um, will relinquish that um, and just say, um, in response to listening to other colleagues, um, I'm intrigued by some of the points that Regent Rocha has just made around uh, the concept and um, the concept and kind of strategic direction of what investing in a promise program in Greater Minnesota Scholarship means as it as it relates to our tuition strategy. So I'm because I'm really in favor of the public safety enhancements um, and think parts of this you know many parts of this budget request are important. I will be supporting it today, um, but look forward to having some increased dialogue and conversations around the points that Regent Rocha just uh, made in our discussion in May. So thank you, Chair. <laughs> Other comments for discussion? I will say that I am going to support this uh, 
uh, request, uh, biennial budget request. And in particular, in thinking about the issues that were raised by both my colleagues, Regent Sviggum and by Regent Rocha in terms of the $30 million that is devoted basically to a certain individuals within Minnesota of need. I, I have struggled with that. Is this the way to go? And the points that both of you have made, I think, are important points. But at the end of the day, when I look at the big picture, the fact is we go to the legislature and we ask for assistance and money for them, and it all, at the end of the day, will help, if we get what we want, reduce the tuition burden on all students. So Minnesota taxpayers, in fact, are investing in or subsidizing, if you want to say that, the education of their uh, students, and hopefully, for the most part, their Minnesota students. It's a burden that, or, or an opportunity that we all as Minnesotans get to engage in by paying taxes and having our money allocated to a variety of different programs, including higher education. So as a, as a taxpayer, I think we all take on that burden uh, where we're asked to subsidize another individual. What I, the reason I'm satisfied with this is because this is now really targeting. This is saying to the legislature, we're going to take those dollars that we would ask in another set of circumstances to reduce tuition across the board. And we're going to take those dollars and we're going to focus and target them on specific people in Minnesota who have need. Um, and that's where we, we, you need to know, that's where the money that you're going to give to us is going to go, is specifically to reduce the burden on those individuals so we can make sure that they are getting an education within the state of Minnesota. So at the end of the day, I can support um, the, the proposal here. I do understand, as I said, the points that are being made. Uh, I don't disagree with you, Regent Rocha, that uh, the traditional way to think about scholarships is through philanthropy. I get it, but I think we have to look at all different sources of income and, uh, and revenues to help reduce the cost of education for students. And I think it's important for the legislature to know that that's how we want to use their money uh, if, or use the taxpayer's money if, in fact, they are to grant our request. So on that basis, I will be supporting this request. Uh, student Representative Wallenhorst. Uh, thank you, Chair and the Board of Regents. Um, if you call at the last meeting, I mentioned that the supplemental budget request that we proposed last year requested roughly $100 million when it come to public safety, or came to public safety. And then when I look at this biennial budget request and see that we're requesting $5 million, not just for the Twin Cities, though it's centered around the Twin Cities, but for all five campuses, um, I draw concern as a student and as an advocate for campus safety that it simply is not enough to cover the massive amount of you know, areas that need some real investment. Uh, last year, I served as co-chair within uh, MSA, now it's USG's Campus Safety Committee. And I saw um, throughout our research that even for simple projects, such as improving lighting within Dinky Town, um, cost projections were over $2.3 million. And so looking at a $5 million request for all five campuses, I question if it is truly enough to resolve student, parent, donor, alumni concerns um, that the university is really taking a focus, a focus and initiative when it comes to campus safety. I recognize that asking $100 million to the legislature for campus safety is a lot, and it didn't work last time. But a five-year plan in which, or a $5 million plan in which it'll take 20 years to reach the equivalent amount simply isn't taking an initiative. And if the Board of Regents really wants to project that it cares about student safety, that it cares about what the community is saying when it comes to campus safety, um, then they should take more focus and more investment on the subject. I yield my time. Thank you, student. Representative Wallenhorst. Any response by the administration as senior VP friends? Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and thank you, uh, Student Representative Wallenhorst, for your comments. And thank you for your support and action on uh, safety around the campus. I appreciate the way you've uh, rolled up your sleeves to help in a number of different ways this last year. You know, one of the things we, we try to uh, be able to plan for is recurring money. It's difficult for us to be able to uh, make some of these improvements without the um, assurance that this money will continue down the road. So the $5 million a year really is quite meaningful. And one of the reasons we wanted to make sure that we had this on a recurring basis 
was to provide opportunities to do systemic step kind of progresses throughout the next number of years. It doesn't you know, preclude us from asking for more, uh, or it doesn't preclude us from seeking additional infrastructure money in the bonding bill. But what this really does is provides the ongoing support for a campus security and, and police force that we think would be adequate, and also supporting some of these other uh, related activities. But you know, in addition, uh, as uh, Vice President Tonneson mentioned, our uh, initial request for the mission, can, it does include other safe, uh, campus safety initiatives as well. So we're not saying this is only, the only amount of money we're gonna spend on public safety. What we're saying is, Part of our public, part of our mission is to make sure that the campus is safe in every respect. And we're gonna focus on that. That is clearly a top priority. We will continue to do that. We're asking for the legislature to help us to the tune of $45 million a year or more this next year and $45 million or more again the next year for all those mission activities, which include a lot of public safety activity. This is in addition to an a special ask to add to that in the way that we think we could help on top of what we have to do every year, no matter what. Is that fair, Vice President Tonneson, in terms of the mission yes. uh, part of that? So this is, it is a part of it, but it's only a part of it. But I, I appreciate your interest and your concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Sviggum. Mm, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, to my colleagues, and especially, specifically to colleague Rosha, I'm gonna try in <clears throat> a minute and a half to convince you to vote yes because I think it's very, very important, folks, that we come out of here united, we go to the legislature united as a team, together. We may not agree with every provision or how the 90 million is gonna be spent specifically, but we have to speak as one group, one body, unified, completely behind the president in our request to the legislature. If not, the legislators will use it as uh, a division within the regents board themselves and they'll thwart it and move it one way or another uh, that they can't even agree and use it as a talking point. Rep Regent Rocha, I would agree with you in regard, and I do agree with you in regards to the Promise Scholarship or the redistribution within student A and student B. But this request is not that. This is re request is additional monies from the legislature to support our current program, Promise Scholarship or the new Greater Minnesota Scholarship. It's not gonna take from student A to give to student B. It's not gonna do that at all. This is additional monies from the legislature to enhance and support the current program we have. Agree with that or not. Uh, but unified, one voice from this board to the regents as a team, I think is extremely important or the legislators will use it against us. I guarantee you, they'll say you have division yourself. How, why am I gonna support your request? So Regent Rosa in a minute and a half, I'm begging you, I'm begging you. Don't agree with everything. I don't agree with everything. But at the end of the day, we're on the same team and don't let other people divide us. Please vote yes. All right. Madam Chair. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> okay, let me, uh, Regent Hipsch hasn't spoken yet, and then uh, Regent Rosha. You. You know, I have an opportunity to respond to <coughs> small colleague. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair Marion. I, I'm not going to take a minute and a half. I agree with uh, uh, Regent Swigum, and I want to encourage us to go forward unanimously. I think it's really important. You know, it's uh, a small percentage of the $700 million and I know none of us agree on 100% of the budget on aspects of it, but this happens to be highlighted, and I agree with everything uh, Regent Swigum said, and I really want to encourage you to vote yes so we can go to the legislature united for the first time in many years. Thank you. All right, Regent Rocha. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Mayor. I, as a sort of a uh, warm-up, I would just point out that the, the, the big distinction between relying on the legislature's progressive uh, means of addressing need and, and the universities is that when the legislature taxes people, they tax the people who are receiving the income. When the university taxes people, especially now that we've gone down this road of, of uh, differentiating between students, we're taxing them based on money that somebody else earns Correct. that they may or may not have access to. So it's, it's, a, it's inefficient and ultimately creates um, uh, divergence from actual need um, among certain people. Maybe it's 90%, but that's still 10% that we're missing the mark on. Um, 
But as to Regent Sviggum, you know, it, it, it still is. First of all, the legislature, once you're past this request, is going to look at the total dollar amount given to this, this system versus Minnesota State versus other recipients of state resources. Um, and this actually hurts the university in the long run. Because again, if, the, if you're a legislator and you've got all of these demands, this incredible uh, number of demands for state support, and you look over here, and when we've got this statement that says people up to X amount of dollars don't you know, have to pay anything or they pay a much lower amount, then we don't demonstrate the same level of need, whereas if the legislature knows that their resources are going to keep it affordable for all students, I think we're much more effective at, at seeking that support. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is not just a one-off. This is actually growing a, what I think is a problem and I think is an inappropriate policy that didn't used to exist. Um, and that, that the money should be, if, if, if that same 30 million was in a nondescript way stated as uh, directed towards maintaining affordability for Minnesota students in a general way, then you would have my support. But to the extent that it's directed at the Promise Scholarship in particular, the Greater Minnesota one doesn't offend me as, as much, um, even though I don't think it's a great policy. I think it's actually it's, you know, kind of harming our own capacity to generate um, more student enrollment from non-residents. Uh, but as it relates to this, the Promise Scholarship, it is so principally and fundamentally inappropriate in my view for a public institution that I can't support it if that is showcased. Now, were Regent Sviggum or Regent Hipsch to move to amend the proposal to remove that component and make it affordability as opposed to directly uh, directing it to Promise, you would, you would have my support. But to the extent it specifically directs it to the Promise Scholarship, I will not vote yes. All right, any further discussion on this particular matter. Uh, there being no further discussion, it appears that we are now ready to vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. No. The motion is approved. Thank you. Next, we will take up the president's recommended 20 22 six-year capital plan. Senior Vice President Franz, please proceed. Thank you, uh, Chair Mayron and members of the committee. I want to take a, just a few minutes to review the six-year capital uh, budget plan that was proposed in September for your review and for your vote today. As you may recall from last month, we had a very short presentation in September because we made no real changes to the six-year plan. We wanted, and we also delayed conversation on the state capital request, which is often part of that, um, that request at the same time. One of the things that we, uh, turn, turns out that it was a, a good idea that we separated out the um, state funding request because we found out just several weeks ago that the uh, management and budget uh, from the governor's uh, direction will only include uh, items in the capital request that were included in the governor's uh, bonding bill proposal in this year, 2022. Well, for the university, uh, that um, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, well, let me let me back up a little bit before I get there. I, I sort of got ahead of myself here. So one of the, one of the things we wanted to do on the next slide, uh, Skeeter, one of the things we wanted to do was to show you briefly sort of what has happened over the last um, 10 years here in terms of the capital requests made and that received from the state. And you can see out of these 10 years, we only have received actual bonding money, uh, bonding bill proceeds in five of those years. Uh, so the, uh, the capital plan is designed to make sure that the board is aware of all capital projects under consideration and, and make sure that we have the limited resources available uh, to focus on the highest priority projects. And uh, one of the things we include in that plan is a list of all projects under consideration. But the fact that, when you look at this slide, the fact that we the, the state has not passed a bonding bill in the last two sessions and the lack of capital investment in two years in a row is almost unprecedented. So one of, one of the things we wanted to do was to talk about the concern about the unpredictability of uh, planning for long-term projects when we have very little uh, predictability in terms of the, f the funding flows that we get. If you look at the, the next slide, uh, this is what I wanted to get to. This, this shows you what we submitted last year as part of the state capital request. 
Uh, you, we, you will recall we had an original request, but we added some December 2021 additions to that. And uh, as I mentioned, the governor's office has informed us uh, through the management budget that uh, this year they will only accept those items included in the 2022 budget, the governor's budget, and that was the chemistry, the undergraduate uh, chemistry teaching laboratories of 72 million on the Twin Cities campus and the capital renewal of HEPR of about $141 million, or $142 million. So uh, it's, a, it's a good thing that we decided to wait because this will give us time to make this presentation and present it to, um, to the to MMB, I think it's by October 24th. One of the things we'll do is we'll, we will make some new analysis of the cost increases, construction cost increases for these items, but the management budget has also informed us that be, they, they will be working on trying to figure out what is the right increase to add to the projects that are already on the list. But one of the things that will happen because of this is that with the fact that we're in a biennial budget year uh, for the legislature, as I mentioned before, I think part of the reasoning for the um, management budget was to reduce the number of items discussed on the bonding bill during the same time that they're working on a, a biennial budget. So the limitation uh, is not uh, is a good thing in the sense that the chemistry teaching building or laboratory is on there and some heap of uh, funding, but a hundred a total of, um, of about two hundred and. $14 million or whatever is just not enough money for the university to really engage in long-term planning. So we're, fr we're a little disappointed that that uh, will happen, but there'll be an opportunity for us to present uh, items directly to the legislature in addition to the governor's bonding bill proposal. But um, it, it does mean that we're limited in some respects of what might take place in this next session. One of the things I want to mention also, um, uh, the next slide, uh, Skeeter, I think we're done here, is that uh, I also want to point out that the strategic facilities and real estate report is part of your docket information items. This report is new this year and it provides a comprehensive summary of the university's physical assets. And this is the information that was previously covered in four different separate standalone reports. And we wanted to provide this annual report at this time. So as we discuss the six year capital plan, you have an additional resource uh, for you to consider this information. So at this point, we would ask that you uh, approve the six-year capital plan. We will come to you in December with a proposal for the bonding bill, which we now know what that proposal will be. It will be the undergraduate student teaching laboratory and the HEPR monies. And then we'll have further discussions about what we might uh, think about in terms of strategy for the legislative session. But at that, uh, Madam Chair, I'm ready for any questions. All right, thank you very much. Before we turn to discussion, is there a motion to recommend approval of the resolution related to the 2022 six-year capital plan? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Madam Chair. Yes, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is, um, maybe you can you know, uh, comment on this. A, a number of years back, the, the armory was uh, was making its way up in prominence on this list, and I don't I don't that I I don't think I saw it. Is that um, did we just have to outlast uh, General Regent uh, Dean Johnson, or <laughs> or is it uh, um, you know because that that building is pretty rough shape, and it and it also houses our post secondary education folks and some other key um, programs. Is that no longer part of the conversation? Oh, first. Uh, Senior Vice President Franz. Uh, thank you, and uh, uh, Interim Vice President uh, of, of uh, Youth Services uh, Kramer can help me out here, but one of the things that we will be talking about as part of the strategic planning policy that we passed, you know, the board passed and, and talked about this last summer, is talking about that list and how do we manage that capital list, which includes all sorts of items, and how do we take that list and make it an act, uh, uh, turn it into active projects? And so that that's going to be. We'll be talking more and more about that in December, some, but also at the end of the year. So it's an ongoing subject matter. But in terms of your specific request, I think uh, Vice President Kramer can answer that question. All right, Interim Vice President Kramer, if you could respond to the question. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Regent Rocha. I don't have the exact number, but it is on the list. It's titled. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you know off the top of your head, it's East Bank. Um, page 23 of the docket. 
page 23 of your docket, and it's titled, uh, it's, yeah, file number 316. And so we've simply rolled it in instead of calling it out specifically because, of course, across the street we have the Bell Museum, and it seems like a more strategic approach would be to look at the entire neighborhood. All right, thank you very much. And uh, any response? Yes, Regent Rocha. Thank you, and, and I, I, that's why I asked the question because I thought there's a good chance because a lot of this stuff appears to be um, sort of broader projects. I still maintain that, that, you know, with the resources and the facilities available at the university that with the state and even the National Guard doing something together for funding mm -hmm. on that specific project as a dual use facility could have some substantial dividends, like tens of millions of dollars worth of dividends in that regard. So something that I would strongly recommend we consider going forward. Senior Vice President Franz. Uh, yeah, thank you, Vice uh, President uh, Kramer, and thank you, Madam Chair. No, I think you're right, and I think one of the things we need to think about is what we want to talk about as we talk strategically about about the neighborhood, the Knoll area. Actually, as you, as you look around that area, there are a number of of beautiful old buildings that are beautiful old buildings and need some kind of renewal, some kind of engagement, um, and and we always kind of look to ourselves, but there are opportunities uh, to think about partnering with, whether it's the state or whether it's with maybe some private entities. I mean, I think we, we owe it to ourselves to be creative about how do we maintain the neighborhood, as uh, Vice President Kramer called it, but in a way that supports the infrastructure, because if we don't fix these buildings pretty soon, you, we all know what eventually will happen. And so that's, I think you, you hit it right, that's the, the challenge for us is how do we get the right investments at the right time to save these uh, buildings and put them into really good use. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Just a quick comment um, to Senior Vice President Franz. I just wanted to thank you for this presentation, particularly um, helpful were the updates around the intricacies with MMB and our, the latest news um, with our Capital Quest and maybe some other things that we may have been told previously that I wasn't tracking or just got lost um, in. So wanted to say thank you particularly um, for this report and, and some of that some of those updates, and then just kind of mentioned by way of mission moment, um, but it's related to this conversation. Um, last, this past Friday, I had the opportunity to join and President Gable at the grand opening of the Carmen D. and James R. Campbell Hall on um, campus here, which is the new Institute for Child Development. Um, and that is a project that was um, in part helped with state dollars um, and significantly, and I think that right there, one of many examples with that right there and in most recent memory um, is why this process, this capital planning, our support from the state for infrastructure is so important. And I think, as I mentioned back on Friday, um, goes way beyond just a pretty piece of infrastructure um, in terms of the mission of the university and the, the future of the state. So um, just wanted to mention that. And thank you, Senior Vice President Franz. Senior Vice President Franz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I, I have to follow it up with thank you, uh, Rep uh, Regent uh, Farnsworth. You know, Listening to Carmen and, and James Campbell speak the last Friday was truly inspiring. And I think there, and there were a number of gifts that went with that. I mean, they were the lead gift, uh, philanthropists, but it's pretty significant. And I'm convinced too that, but for that philanthropy, uh, that project wouldn't be done yet. I'm not saying it wouldn't, would never be done, but it wouldn't be done yet probably. And so that is the perfect combination of philanthropy, uh, state money involved there, university money's involved there, and taking a top-ranked program and giving it a top-ranked a top -ranked building and facility to, to maximize our investments. It's a total success, but thank you for mentioning that. Good speaking points to go when you go to the legislature. Yes. All right. All right, any further discussion on this uh, motion? There being no further discussion, it appears everyone's ready to vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please aye. say aye. Thank you. <laughs> All those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. Thank you very much. Now we turn to our fourth agenda item, which is review and action on the resolution related to the amended and restated operating agreement of 2407 University Investment LLC. Here to outline the resolution are Associate Vice President Mike Volna, Assistant Vice President Leslie Krieger, and Senior Vice President, I'm sorry, Senior Associate General Counsel Gregory Brown. 
Senior Vice President Franz, would you like to tee this up for us? Madam Chair, well, this group hardly needs any introduction, but I, I will anyway. Um, and thank you. As you will remember, um, in July, we asked the board to approve the acquisition of, of the United Properties' 51% interest in this property. At, as you recall, we had a joint venture with United Properties, and they had 51%, and we had 49%. So it, as we discussed in July, this, uh, the 2407 property is governed by a, a, a limited liability company. I was going to say LLC, and I'm trying to stamp out the use of acronyms, but uh, <laughs> limited liability company by a member control and uh, operating agreement. Now, this operating agreement governs the LLC's power to con conduct business, but the existing agreement is specific to the ownership of uh, and governance structure with the university and United Properties. And the Office of General Counsel has determined that there are really challenges for us to use this, to use the existing operating agreement after the university acquires 2407, the property or the the interest in the in that uh, LLC from United Properties. So the resolution before you today, uh, we ask you to adopt is an amended and restated agreement that removes all the provisions that related to the previous ownership structure and replaces them with a language that reflects that after this change, the university will own, have 100% control over the limited liability company. Now, th this approach was modeled after the university's operating agreement for the 2515 University Avenue uh, LLC that was established by the board in May of 2019 for the University Village Apartments property. Uh, and this is a typical situation where the university is engaged in actions other than running a university uh, that we want to uh, ask your uh, approval of. So I'm going to ask Associate Vice President and uh, Assistant CFO Folna and Assistant Vice President Krieger and Senior Associate General Counsel Brown to summarize the key points and and tell us what they would like us to approve, if that's all right, Madam Chair. It certainly is. All right. Who would like to start us off? Yes. I will go first. Thank you. Chair Aaron, Senior Vice President of France, members of the committee, thank you very much. In your docket materials, you, uh, in addition to the docket information summary, you have three documents. The first is the resolution itself. The second is a summary of the member control and operating agreement. And then the third item for clarity and transparency is the full text of the operating agreement itself that um, we are proposing to replace. Uh, to be the replacement. Um, the resolution today that's in front of you, if you approve it, uh, will accomplish three things. First, it will adopt this new member control and operating agreement. And Greg Brown here in a moment will talk about why that's important to do. Um, second, if you adopt this, it will ratify any actions that have been taken by the university between that time when um, we closed on the property and when you and when you approve this new operating agreement. Um, and Assistant Vice President Creer can talk a little bit about that and whether or not there's been any actions that have been taken. And then third, it authorizes the administration to implement all aspects of the member control and operating agreement, including appointing members of the management committee and um, appointing the officers um, of the LLC. Um, just a, a point on the review and action. We're requesting review and action today, which is outside your normal process, um, but we felt it was important to get this done in a timely fashion. When we started down the process of acquiring the LLC back in July, we had not fully completed a, much of the due diligence that we needed to do prior to closing. And as we got into that, we realized um, that the current member control and operating agreement was simply not going to work for the university under this new ownership structure. And so rather than extend and delay um, good governance and putting something in place that reflects what we need to have in place to manage it effectively, we thought that it would be worth it to ask you to review and approve in one action today. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to my colleagues for more discussion. All right, who is next? Who would like to tee this up next? Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Associate Vice President Volna. Uh, Chair Mehron, uh, members of the committee, um, I'm sorry I didn't get Senior Vice President Fran's memo about ac um, 
acronyms or, or <laughs> other ways in which I'm going to describe these documents. So I, I will be saying MCOA, uh, the Member Controlled and Operating Agreement. I will be saying LLC. And when I say that, I'm referring to 2407 University Lim Investment Limited Liability Company. So with, with, with that admonition. Um, in all seriousness, I want to describe uh, why the MCOA in its current form doesn't work and give you more detail for that. I then want to highlight one significant amendment to it that is being proposed by the administration, one that really touches on the board's oversight and control over 2407 and go in some detail about what the administration is proposing <clears throat> with respect to your reserve powers over the LLC. And I want to close with um, a discussion about why this particular structure, uh, using an LLC to operate this business, uh, at least made sense to OGC and sort of recommending to the administration this is a continuation of the structure that 2407 is operating under. So I'll start with the MCOA as originally written, as, as you have, have heard, contemplated two members and it contemplated that uh, university, uh, university would in some respects be um, a second partner to United Properties or United Properties kind of driving the bus, let's say. With the university's purchase of United Properties interests, United Properties will not have a role in the operation of 2407. Uh, there, the ties will be completely severed. Uh, United Properties will step down as managing member. The, the board members appointed by United Properties Three of the five will resign. Um, and when post-closing, there will only be one governor left, Senior Vice President of France. As the MCA is structured, that means that we will not have a quorum for Board of Governors actions. It also means that we don't have a day-to-day -day manager for the LLC, and we will be in a a difficult, it will be a difficult situation to try and actually transact business for the LLC. So we actually have to amend the MCOA to reflect both the change in ownership structure, but also to change the governance and the powers that are going to be allocated to the LLC. So that, that's just a clean reading of the MCOA and what we need to do. You have the document itself, the revised uh, MCOA, you will notice, and I want to highlight one point here, the regents reserved authorities. We're calling them member reserved acts. The structure here is that the board of regents has the authority to decide which authorities to delegate to the LLC. You control it. The administration has proposed 15 specific reservations for the Board of Regents. And I just want to make sure I get this right, so if you don't mind, I'm going to actually read the important parts. And are you able to refer us in our slide deck to where we could read with you if it's in the amended, I take it's in the amended and restated operating agreement, is it, that it correct? It is, All in right. its particular section, section 4.3. All right, thank you. 876. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I think it's uh, on ours. It's, it looks like 81 of, of the uh, materials. 4.3 member reserved acts. Correct. Got it. Okay. Thank you, Chair Mehran. Um, high level. The Board of Regents would have the sole authority to approve the LLC, LLC's lending or borrowing more than $10,000. Same with guaranteeing another person's debt. It could not acquire another company without the Board of Regents approval. It cannot buy goods or services for more than $1 million without your approval. It cannot trade securities. It cannot buy or sell real estate. And it could not <coughs> lease property for more than $1 million without your approval. <coughs> Those, as I said, there are 15 that are laid out, but the administration's thinking here is that those are authorities that are most appropriately delegate or reserved by the board to allow it to discharge its fiduciary responsibilities consistent with delegations to the administration through the university administrator and to the LLC such that he conduct, can conduct his day-to-day -day activities. 
Now, Ass Assistant Vice President Krieger will describe other key provisions of the proposed um, MCOA, but I want to conclude my remarks by describing the benefits of this structure. And there are clear, at least our thinking, legal benefits to this, but I want to start with just the practical aspect of it. In our negotiations with United Properties, the university first proposed purchasing the land that's owned by the LLC. It was actually going to be an asset deal. United Properties counterproposed with purchase of equity. That necessitated continuing to use this structure. So to accommodate the way in which United Properties preferred to structure the transaction, we necessarily had to continue to use this particular structure. Now, going forward, the question is, okay, why do you continue to use this structure? And the principal reason is this is a, this is a liability shield. For the same reasons it made sense for 2515, the idea here is that the university is going to be operating a hotel. It will be leasing commercial property to run a, a restaurant. And I believe the thinking is that these are not necessarily core functions of the university and would be better to have it segregated for liability purpose from the university. The other part about this is you can appreciate this is a going concern. While the university has been involved in managing the LLC, it has not been the manager. So there is, there is in all of these deals a, a concern that there are unknown liabilities that will, that will become known in time. It is better, at least legally, to have those segregated such that those are not on the university's balance sheet, those are not university obligations, until we have a much better sense of what those obligations are. So that's, that is the principal reason the Office of General Counsel believed that recommending a continuation of the use of this vehicle made sense. And with that, I will turn to uh, Vice Assistant Vice President Krieger. Assistant Vice President Krieger. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. As Senior Associate General Counsel Brown uh, noted, uh, the MCOA, MCOA uh, clearly states the Board of Regents Oversight through those member-controlled acts. This is the first layer of control that the university exerts over the 2407 LLC. There are two other layers of control that I'm going to briefly address. The second layer is the LLC's management committee, which is composed of university employees, and they will provide the oversight to the LLC's operations, including the contract with Oak Management, which is the on-site manager of the Days Hotel. Senior Vice President of Finance and Operations, Franz, acting as the university administrator under the operating agreement, will appoint members to the management committee and will have overall supervisory authority and oversight of the LLC and the management committee. The proposed initial membership of the management committee is also included <coughs> in your docket materials today. The third and final layer of university control is the actual officers of the 2407 LLC, which provide the day-to-day -day governance and oversight. The president of the 2407 LLC will have active supervision, ma supervision, management, direction, and control of business affairs, and um, again, under the general control and management of the management committee and the university administrator. Other components of the <coughs> operating agreement before you today provide direction on standard operating procedures for the LLC. It also includes provisions for allocations and distributions, liability, indemnification, and insurance, and finally, dissolution, liquidation, and termination of the LLC. Now, in addition to re the resolution <coughs> approving the operating, the restated and amended operating agreement, uh, the resolution also includes, uh, allows for board approval of any actions taken by university employees between the time of closing on the purchase with United Properties and the time of the new amended and restated operating agreement is executed. The university has not yet closed on the transaction and as a result, assuming the board approves the operating agreement at tomorrow's meeting, we will be able to execute the operating agreement concurrently with the closing. And this concludes our summary of the proposed resolution and we welcome any questions the committee has on this matter. Thank you very much. Before we turn to discussion, is there a motion to recommend approval of the resolution related to the amended and restated operating agreement of 2407 University Investment LLC? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Any other? 
All right, then uh, because there is no discussion, it appears that the regents are ready to vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Please, any opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now take a 10 minute recess. The Finance and Operations Committee stands in recess until, let's say, I'm going to give you 13 minutes, let's say, till 2 10 p.m. Thank you. You're a hard driver.
Okay. I call the Finance and Operations Committee back to order. Now we turn our discussion item to our discussion item for today, agenda item three, which is a discussion of the key cost drivers of system-wide information technologies. Vice President Bernie Golacek will lead this discussion. Senior Vice President Franz, would you like to get us started? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, Vice President Golacek is here today to help us understand the key cost drivers associated with information technologies technologies at the university and how we're using resources to support a proactive approach to IT. IT is not really an acronym anymore, is it? It's just a thing, right? I'm okay using IT. Right? As a system-wide officer for uh, information technology, Vice President Golacek will provide an overview of the technology management function and how it operates to serve the university's needs across the system. As we all know, after a rapid, rapid pivot to remote instruction and adapting all of our work around the university to support general operations due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Vice President Golacek's teams are now focused on maintaining a hybrid environment that supports the university's mission. One area that I do want to highlight as part of the Vice President Golacek's presentation is the opportunities that PEAK are presenting within their IT world. While significant, they're a little bit different from peak activities you've been briefed on before because of IT's relative maturity, both in its service model and its, in its organizational uh, design. So I hope you find this presentation insightful, and I think it's a critical component of how we operate as a university today and into the future. So, Madam Chair, I would ask to turn it over to Vice President Gulacek. All right. The topic is so turned over to you. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chair Mayron, members of the committee. I'm delighted to be here today to share with you the way in which the information technology management function supports the University of Minnesota and to discuss key cost drivers for doing just that. To work through this topic, I propose that I provide you with a basic overview of IT operations at the university illustrate several ways in which IT supports MPAC 2025, share with you the key cost drivers for information technologies at the University of Minnesota, and describe several major initiatives underway. Briefly provide you with insight to future investments so that you're not surprised when you hear about them, and close with information technology outcomes that I expect as a result of PEAK's initiative. As part of the overview of IT operations, let's begin by grounding ourselves in a few University of Minnesota information technology facts. Services that I reference are used on all campuses, extension offices and research and outreach centers. These services are used system-wide. The total number of IT staff members in an information technology classification represents 6% of all university IT staff and information technology spending represents about 6% of the institution's total expenditures. There are 21 centralized services that are used in all locations throughout the university system. In short, information technology support, enable, and advance the goals and objectives of the University of Minnesota. While there's no mention of information technologies in the university's mission statement, you can't show me many parts of the mission that isn't enabled by the use of information technologies. I like to refer to the IT service model as our IT ecosystem. The ecosystem is, as I mentioned, a catalog of 21 centralized IT services shown in the center of this illustration that are complemented by a portfolio of unique pedagogical discipline or business line specific services, which are shown in the outer portion of that circle. Examples of services unique to a discipline include specialized instructional electronic medical record systems. They include instrumentation and research equipment and instructional lab uh, technologies. Examples of services that are unique to support units include library, dining, residence hall, and athletic technologies that are specialized to each of those business lines. 
This is an intentional model where the placement of these services simply shows the extent to which information technologies are needed in each and every part of the university. The details of the outermost portion of the ecosystem showed just to you examples of uh, technologies that are detailed in the institution's technology portfolio. The technology portfolio is essentially an asset inventory of the technologies that are in use and are available to members of the university community. As you can see from this slide, there are over 1,100 entries into this asset management database that describe purpose, availability, near-term service changes, and the point of contact for each of those technologies. This enables the service desk, which is a central service, to triage support calls and enables other technologists to check this repository to help students or staff in need of solutions before purchasing something new. It's extraordinarily important to manage this closely because identifying duplication is impossible without this data. The technology services and tools of which you just saw examples are informed through a, a robust IT service governance program. This program is one that informs us of what we aren't doing today that we should be doing, what we are doing today that we should do better, and what we should stop doing. Each year, students, faculty, and staff members are invited to provide feedback on IT services through an annual electronic survey or a focus group session or after each encounter with IT services um, that they have used at the university. Core business functionality changes, like an enrollment management or finance system uh, 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 IT activities, are determined by the business owner. Faculty, student, and business stakeholder governance provides important input to service levels and the way in which services are delivered. It's extremely important for you to understand that IT is aligned to and driven by these stakeholders and business needs. IT doesn't do this for itself. Monitoring and improving system and service performance is a core tenet of IT operations. Technology teams measure the performance of systems and services continuously, matching that performance to availability goals and service level agreements. Early in the pandemic, my team began to professionalize this practice by employing site reliability engineering techniques used by the Googles, the Facebooks, and the Amazons of the world to proactively predict system failures before they occur, avoiding disruption and outages. This is an example of the levels of complexity and sophistication that are needed to sustain IT at the university and an example of the need to professionalize IT practices as technology systems become more and more complex. In addition to monitoring system and service performance, we actively measure the financial performance of all the management function in all parts of the institution. I'll dive deeper into these cost components in just a few moments. But before I do that, I would like to illustrate information technology's commitment to MPAC 2025 and its strategic priorities. A few examples include the fact that IT promotes student success by providing student-focused teaching and learning systems, video conferencing applications, and by supporting students' technology experience through our 24 by 7 by 365 service desk. IT supports this research powerhouse by managing and maintaining research data storage services and high-performance networks and computing. IT serves the state and impacts the world by partnering with the state of Minnesota, Minnesota State, and the Learning Network of Minnesota to enable distance education for Minnesota's K-12 systems, enabling them access to Internet2, the world's research and education network, to reach content across the globe. IT is equitable, diverse, and inclusive by delivering accessible technologies and by recruiting and retaining a diverse workforce. And finally, IT is a responsible steward of resources, ensuring that technologies are in lockstep alignment with the institution's pedagogical and business needs and to do that in the most efficient way possible. Now, with that context, 
I'd like to turn to the institution's information technology cost drivers and the way in which we manage these costs. What you see in front of you is a pie chart that's an all-in snapshot of the institution's annual IT operations expenses by categories that you see here. They include all operational expenses, regardless of funding source or purpose. And it shouldn't be a surprise that a majority of the IT's costs are in its people and the software that is licensed. As I mentioned earlier in this overview, IT represents 6% of the institution's expenditures. This percentage is ranged between 5 and 7% during the 15 years that I've been measuring these numbers. As a matter of comparison, Gartner reports an education industry average of 5.3%. However, that includes K through 12 systems, which are significantly less technology intensive. The comparisons that I choose to focus on are those of institutions with comparable missions and technology intensity. The Big Ten average is a shade over 6% at 6.24%. While the national research doctoral institutions, both public and private, are around 7%. These comparisons are helpful, but they're not necessarily authoritative without a, a, a portfolio comparison of services. But given these benchmarks, the university compares favorably if your focus is in cost control. I use this data to drive conversations then at the unit level with each university unit leader. For instance, I meet with each dean, each chancellor, and vice president every year to discuss IT service levels and to monitor IT expenses at the unit level. This is an important illustration. The, the School of Dentistry serves as the example in this IT profile. And this is an important illustration because you might be asking yourself why the School of Dentistry's portion, yellow portion of the pie chart is larger than the average of all academic units. And this is the conversation that we have with the dean an appreciation for the compliance requirements associated with healthcare data blended with its instructional purpose provide this answer and allow the dean and I a deeper understanding of the unit's IT needs and how they differ with the average. Additional data enables the unit leader and I to review components of the unit's expenses for local services and the central services funded by the IT cost pool. We review the inflection point that you see on the stacked bar chart to determine if it's in the right place and to talk about ways to improve service quality and to gain efficiencies. I provide internal benchmark comparison numbers for other academic units in the university as a reference point for them. I also have the same conversations with leaders of support units with data that is specific to their operations. To be clear, these are IT profiles, not scorecards, they help me and our senior leaders understand and therefore support the common and the different IT needs of an enterprise made up of many different lines of business. You saw previously that the majority of the university's IT expenses are in its people. Technologists, the people that run our systems, are also the IT management function's most important asset. Technologies don't run themselves. Because of this, and what we've experienced over the last two and a half years, and what we're witnessing in the employment market today, I'd like to spend a bit of time talking about this most important category of IT cost driver with you. In the marketplace, the number of IT positions continues to grow at a rate that's faster than the number of IT professionals in the workforce. This creates an increase in vacancies which results in great opportunity for IT professionals and fierce competition for talent among employers. The end, of, the end of last year marked the highest number of IT vacancies in Minnesota in more than 20 years, according to the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. Proactive efforts and partnering with human resources has ensured that the university is able to meet its IT talent needs. Talent acquisition specialists and recruiters specializing in the IT workforce actively source passive candidates, market job openings, 
and ensure an inclusive and valid selection process, equipping IT to successfully compete in our market. Many of our hires are sourced from our strongest competitors for talent, Best Buy, Oracle, United Health Group, uh, Wells Fargo, Accenture, Prime Therapeutics are just but a few examples. This year's annualized um, external attrition rate for IT professionals leaving the university is at 14.7%. According to Mercer's 2022 Workforce Movement Survey, this rate is below the 20% average for all jobs generalized and their turnover in the market. This healthy rate of attrition is an opportunity in that we are able to add new skills and perspectives to our teams while also maintaining a stable and dedicated workforce. IT has strategically seized the opportunity that attrition has provided to support MPAC 2025 and the university's commitment to diversity. For instance, the BIPOC population of the IT workforce has grown from 8 to 21% in the last seven years since I've been in this role. Recruiting and retaining these talented staff members is not just about compensation. A comprehensive, disciplined, human resource practice serves as the cornerstone for an effective IT workforce strategy. In addition to recruitment and selection, performance management helps an IT manager enhance results, correct performance issues, help employees develop, and also help them employ those employees know where their next step in their career might be. IT's employee engagement survey response rate of well over 90% provided data showing a dedicated and committed workforce intended on delivering high quality services to this institution. And thanks to the refined job family structure completed last year by Vice President Horseman and his team, we have the ability to intentionally manage compensation to the market with more specificity than we ever have before. As you can see, retention is not a standalone effort. Rather, it's the result of a comprehensive set of variables that are important to a technologist and that technologist's success at the university. And to close out the cost driver piece of this agenda, I simply want to underscore the pace at which technologies change and the challenges that we face as it, results, as it relates to compliance. Policy and law almost always follow innovation and advancements in technologies, often causing an abrupt shift or transition in response to a new rule set. The agility of the institution's technologists and their adaptability to change is key, along with ensuring that they have enough time in their work plans to do the little things well, details that ensure compliance. We'll talk more about compliance and cybersecurity at tomorrow afternoon's session. So I want to put a pin in that. Now, I would like to simply highlight a few of the larger multi-year initiatives that are underway, most of which fit into the continuous improvement category. We continue to focus our effort on building the next generation digital learning environment as new ways of online learning emerge. And over the last two and a half years, we've seen a lot of that, right? This environment includes several ancillary teaching learning tools yielding data known in the industry as learning analytics. These analytics will enable the institution to understand the conditions that enable student success in a digital classroom. One example of this evolving environment and the use of analytics is the development of the next gen programs. Next gen med went live recently on the Rochester campus. Next Gen Ag's implementation in Crookston is imminent, and the university technologists support these and all of the next gens that will follow. The university's continuing operations and pursuit of its strategic priorities is predicated on its ability to access systems and to have confidence in our data. Technologists continue to secure the devices that access important systems of record to mitigate vulnerabilities as yet another layer of protection. Technologists continue to make progress on identity and access management program, of which you receive updates twice per year through the audit committee materials. This multi-year effort will ensure that only the right people have the right access to the right systems at the right time. Your materials reflect this prog excuse me, your materials reflect this progress, and you will see me again in May 
at the audit committee meeting to provide an in-person update to this program. Cloud computing represents a significant opportunity for the university as it manages its technology infrastructure for all of the reasons that you see presented here. Using infrastructure services provided by Amazon, Oracle, Microsoft, and Google, technologists can improve the reliability of systems while reducing the amount of infrastructure gear that needs to physically be located on our campuses. This initiative replaces the need to procure server hardware, thereby reducing the reliance on the maintenance of high cost data centers, which ultimately shifts capital expenses to operating expenses for a sizable portion of the university's enterprise service server hardware in infrastructure. And as we look into the future, I simply wanna give you insight to key investments that will need to be made to sustain the institution's operations. We will continue to invest in next-gen programs and other enhanced digital learning tools and modalities because that is squarely in our mission. But the systems that support things like that, the data network, will need to be replaced when it is no longer supported by the software updates and security patches that we receive from the vendor. The last upgrade was a $70 million price tag. There'll be a competitive purchasing process that will need to be done, but that's in our future. Additionally, our core business systems, the PeopleSoft suite, will need to be upgraded or replaced by 2031. While that date could change if Oracle decides to continue its support beyond 2031, I project an 18-month implementation project that if we're done today, depending upon whether we stay with the current vendor or change to a new one, could range between 80 million and 250 million. Managing the key cost drivers that I've covered is imperative to technology sustainability and to the institution's long-term financial health, which is why PEAK is so critical to the university's future. I'd like to acknowledge that IT has two roles as it relates to PEAK. The first is that we have the responsibility to provide technologies that support the new services and processes that are being created by human resources, finance, procurement, and marketing and communications. IT is working closely with the Peak Success Office, with Huron, and with university business owners to ensure that robust, sustainable services are delivered to support these needs. The second role for IT through the Peak process is to exploit our expertise and our capacity as a management function. As SVP Franz referenced in his introduction, IT has an opportunity to build on a really solid foundation. After all, we've been maturing for over two decades, centralizing services, developing the service model, and, and tweaking the organizational design in the IT management function it's in a really nice position to take the next significant step, which is precisely consistent with PEAK's goals, to deliver quality consistently and efficiently. We will achieve this by establishing accountability control points in the areas of IT purchasing and IT staffing. And while practiced in good faith today, we will establish formal accountabilities between technologists, between the enterprise and the local unit, and between the local unit and the enterprise. And finally, PEAK will enable workforce fluidity, strengthening service teams that are way too thin, establishing new enterprise service teams, and assembling the functional teams that support them are what our goals are. The strengthening or creation of new enterprise service teams surrounds a technologist who today does the same work as others in different units, but works in relative isolation with a team of colleagues. These colleagues learn from each other as part of working in teams. Teams grow <coughs> and mature together, and with the right accountability, deliver quality consistently. Professional development and career pathways become clearer as staff are exposed to and work side by side with like professionals. The institution scale should provide career path opportunities for university technologists without administrative friction. This model positions that. Ultimately, IT is an expertise 
Ultimately, I'm sorry, this is an IT expertise and capacity optimization strategy that will sustain IT as part of the university's long-term sustainability. This is the importance of PEEP to IT. Finally, and in conclusion, if there's anything that I need you to take away from this presentation, it's to underscore the reality that IT makes the whole institution more productive and efficient. And the centralization of services and technologies has occurred over decades and will continue, peak or not. While IT is an administrative function, IT is also a key strategic enabler to this university. The importance of getting this right is really important because, Madam Chair, members of the committee, when you close your eyes and you envision this institution in the next 5, 10, or 20 years, I guarantee you that you will see more technology in that future and not less. Chair Mayron, members of the committee, this concludes my presentation. I look forward to your feedback and to answering your questions. Thank you for your engagement today. Well, thank you for, um, uh, you are so engaged in this topic, which for several of us, uh, we would consider to be nerdy. <laughs> but you love it and you are passionate about it. There are a couple of nerds up here. And I greatly appreciate your, your passion and um, engagement about it. Um, it's so important to the university. Um, can't underestimate it. All right, so so much for my comments. Uh, comments by other regents. Yes, Regent Hipsch. Uh, thanks, uh, Jay. Or Regent Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Regent nerd. All right. uh, sometimes when, you, when you're talking, I also think, wow, she's way over my head. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, what caught me was the IT professionals outpace, or IT positions outpace IT professionals. And uh, I'm thinking to me, and then the, you ended the slide with there's going to be way more technology in the future than there is right now. And then you brought up your slide on next gen med and next gen ag and why not next gen IT and why not uh, go all in on, uh, on uh, educating more and more people so we can fill this demand. If other people are hiring, what'd you say, 14.7% of our people away from us? That's a good thing because we want people to be successful, but it's also hard for us to staff. So. We need, we need, if there's, you know, that's the farmer in me whenever there's a demand, you know, fill the supply. So um, that's what I like to, that's my takeaway from this program. I can't fix the IT, I'm, but I can help with that part of it. So thank you. Thank you. Any comment? You're so, Chair we rendered Mayron, you speechless. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Chair Mayron, uh, Regent Hipsch, uh, members of the committee, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I mean, there are a lot of strategies that we use to determine whether or not, um, uh, you know, it doesn't take a computer science degree to do IT, right? And so there are plenty of ways for us to evaluate roles and evaluate competencies for those roles. And those roles don't always require a computer science or a highly technical degree. And so we do that, but I, you know, I'd love to teach in the next gen IT program and along with uh, several technologists that I have on my staff that would love to participate in that program and, 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 and bring along a number of other technologists into the field. Thank you. I have a quick question. You talked about that you um, hire from Best Buy, you know, major private uh, employers. Are you able to be competitive in terms of compensation and overall package? Because that is clearly a challenge between the public sector and the private sector is how to be competitive with the private sector. Chair Mayron, members of the committee, yes, we are able to be competitive. We've hired 96 people this year alone. I mean, th there is a lot of turnover and there's a lot of churn in the, in the IT management function. But the fact that we can bring them in and bring them in with the competency that, and the skill sets that we know that we need. And the fact that they're willing to come tells you that we can compete in the market. We lose technologists to the same places. Plus, we've lost technologists to uh, Google, to Amazon, to Zoom. Um, so it's a pretty vibrant market and you just need to learn how to manage the churn. Okay. Other questions? Uh, yes, uh, student representative. Wallenhorst. 
I just have a clarifying question. Um, so right now, I'm a student at the College of Liberal Arts. And say one of my professors has an issue concerning IT. Would there be like a specific CLA like IT department, or is it centralized among either campuses or the entire system wide, or how is that divided? Yep. Chair Mayron, Regent yes. Wallenhorst, and and the, and the rest of the committee. CLA has technologists that focus on the liberal arts. Your faculty member would likely call the centralized service desk, and depending upon the issue, whether it's something that has to be fixed, it might be able to be done electronically, or we might have to send a technologist out to that, out to that computer itself, or if the, tech, if the challenge or the issue that the, that the faculty member was calling about was related to uh, uh, one of the discipline-specific services that the College of Liberal Arts provides to your faculty member, they would, they would attend to that. But the key to that equation is that we can triage because of, because of the asset management um, um, uh, system that I showed you and the technology portfolio that we are aware of, we can triage that issue to the right person for, for really quick handling. Thank you. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try my best not to be nerdy. All right. Um, <laughs> lest you cut me out. I'm going to pay for that. <laughs> um, Representative Wallenhorst's question was definitely planted by the PICA committee. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, I, I think that was a great question. and. and um, I think this is a great opportunity um, for Peak. You had a slide where it was, it was the little graphic of the lonely IT employee, and that was me as a student employee working for CLA at UMD in Kirby Plaza, but not working for Jason Davis's you know, shop. So I think there's um, uh, lots of opportunities there. Um, I crossed out most of my nerdy questions, so I'll ask the the, the governance one. Um, it, you, you mentioned enhanced online learning. Um, I think obviously that, that's, a, that's a really important topic as we've seen and obviously with our next gen initiatives. And to, on that topic, how do you, how do you partner with the, the faculty, the, the academic side, the provost's office? Obviously we don't want that side, you know, making the IT decisions, leading the shadow IT and whatnot, but at the same time, um, their input it has to be at the forefront, I imagine, in helping design those systems and, and you know, um, give their expertise in aiding you and your team in making the technological decisions. Yeah. Vice President Gullick. Chair Mayron, yeah, yes. yeah, Regent Kenyanya and, and members of the committee, we, we talk to many faculty members, many faculty member consultative committees, and we work very closely with the provost's office and her teams that are positioned to be able to help us navigate that complicated space, right? I mean, there are lots of needs, and, and we can't afford every need. So how do we prioritize and how do we sort through those things that uh, really matter to the academy? and to the instruction um, um, uh, uh, portion of the mission that we need to fulfill. So we talk to many people to do that. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I won't ask the others. OK. <laughs> Any other questions or issues for discussion? All right, hearing none, Vice President Golacek, thank you very much. Appreciate your presentation and your energy and enthusiasm. And thank you. All right. All right, at this time, we will move to item, uh, the information items, uh, Senior Vice President Franz. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I would like to highlight three items. And first of all, I'd like to highlight the asset management report. Um, for a quick overview and a summary of the university's endowment performance, I'd like, uh, like to invite Andrew Parks, the Deputy Chief Investment Officer of the Office of Investment and Banking to the table uh, to give you a short uh, review of our uh, recent um, results uh, for the university, Madam Chair. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Chief Investment Officer Parks, if, take it away. Uh, thank you, Regent Mayron and members of the committee. It's uh, hard to follow Bernie, but uh, um, 
So the annual asset management report that you have in your information items is intended to uh, basically provide a snapshot of the performance and the positioning of the various pools of capital that the Office of Investments and Banking is tasked with managing on behalf of the institution. Uh, today, those, those pools total about $4.5 billion. Now, my commentary is going to focus primarily on the endowment, just given that's the largest pool. Uh, but I do want to just note that the other pools you'll see listed there have all delivered performance numbers that are in excess of their benchmarks over all time periods, which we're, we're pleased to report. Now, specifically on the endowment, both the short and long-term performance has been very strong, which is really the key takeaway I'll leave with you. Uh, and that's the case if we look at performance through uh, absolute benchmark relative and pure relative lenses. So on an absolute basis, uh, if we look at the 1, 3, 5, and 10-year numbers, they're all in excess of 11% annualized, and those are all well in excess of their respective benchmarks. What I want to do is just convert that a little bit into to dollars and cents to the institution. So uh, as I mentioned, the endowment is, is about two and a quarter billion. Had over the last 10 years, we had just invested passively in a globally diversified mix of stocks and bonds. Uh, you'll see on slide 120 of your deck, that the endowment would have ended up at about 1.25 billion. So there's an entire billion dollars of excess value that's been added over the last decade, just associated with uh, some of the outperformance associated with the, the strategy shifts um, and tilts that we've leaned into over, the, over that time period. Now, we've talked about those in the past. Some of them are listed on slide 124. Um, at a high level, that's just stocks over bonds, but more specifically, that's been US over non-US, that's been uh, private credit over public credit, private equity over uh, public equity, um, and most meaningfully, a, a heavy dose of venture capital, which is really a bet on, on growth and innovation. Uh, specifically for FY22, the endowment returned 11.4% uh, to provide a little bit of context and some of the drivers of that. The first was uh, related to just monetizations that we were able to, um, to exit out of. Um, I remember Regent Powell last year had asked a question about you know, coming out of the straw in FY21 where we had returned 49% uh, are we able to take some chips off the table um, and really benefit from the frothy uh, pricing. And so we were pleased that we were able to turn over and sell about 11% of the portfolio this past year and lock in those gains. Um, in addition to that, while well, private equity and venture did well at north of 20%, uh, we also had the benefit of some diversifying strategies. So credit was up about 9%, even though the public fixed income markets were down 11%. Uh, real estate was up 16, natural resources were up 18, so there was a nice uh, balance really across the portfolio that we hadn't seen in a while. Uh, to a large degree, it actually felt like a year in which we won by not losing, in that we had uh, very small exposures to U.S. stocks, which were down 11, to U.S. fixed income, which was down 11, so our tilts towards private were, were helpful. The last thing that I'll mention with respect to the FY22 performance is that while we don't uh, really seek to uh, manage to performance versus our peers. Uh, the median university endowment this past year was down 8%. Uh, the top quartile endowment was down 4%. The top fifth percentile uh, was up 1%. And at 11, I believe we're going to probably be either one of, if not the best performing university endowments in the country. So um, now that said, it feels, uh, I'd be remiss to not point out that it feels a little bit conflicting to be sitting here talking about uh, you know, the strong past performance given the capital market environment we find ourselves in. Uh, it's a little bit like driving down the highway and you look in the rear view and you see nothing but blue skies and sunlight and you look in front of you and you see you know, thunderstorms, if not right above you. And so uh, we just finished a period in which the last three quarters, stocks and bonds were negative. Uh, that hasn't happened in modern history. Um, so it's a very challenging environment. Now, as long-term investors, we have the ability to not be too myopic and focused on, on short-term volatility. Uh, that said, it does feel very much like it's not a run-of-the-mill recession and that there have been numerous multi-year, some cases multi-decade long um, uh, shifts that have been taking place that are really providing uh, what had been ha uh, tailwinds to our portfolio, uh, now headwinds. And so globalization, low interest rates, low inflation, uh, certainly geopolitical stability, um, accommodative monetary policy, a lot of liquidity in the markets, et cetera. All of these are shifting um, and making it a very challenging environment. So um, I would say we're spending a lot of time focused on that area. Uh, we're going to be talking to the Investment Advisory Committee in a couple of weeks on a lot of those topics. But I'd say the, the summary is it feels very much like a uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times type, type environment. But um, you know, I can assure you that our office is, is laser focused on executing and, and innovating, uh, really regardless of market uh, market regime. So, with that, I will pause. I'd be happy to respond to any questions if there are some. Senior Vice President France. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Deputy uh, Chief Investment Officer. Um, 
Um, I think the, uh, I, I just want to underscore what was said, and that is, uh, as Andrew talked about it, 11.4%, that's, that's a positive number in front of 11.4%. My portfolio is less than what I had a year ago. I'm just saying that uh, I, it, what, the ability for this group to do what they've done this, I mean, a year ago was incredible, 49%, but 11.4% in this environment this last year is simply uh, outstanding, and I think we're going to find very few other uh, groups able to do that. Congratulations to your team and uh, Stuart Mason and the team that you all work with. But I just kind of wanted to go back to your headline number because it's pretty impressive. Thank you, Madam Chair. Excellent. Any comments or discussion <laughs> on this topic? All right. Any? Oh, yes, uh, Student Representative Wallenhorst. Uh, I just have a question, and it's perfectly fine if you don't know the answer. Um, it's less about the annualized market returns. Those are the dangerous returns. ones. <laughs> it's less about the annualized market returns, but rather the investments themselves. Um, do you know the status of the university's decision to remove themselves from fossil fuel investments? You mentioned natural gas uh, returns um, in, your, in your speech. Um, and what is the status of that? What are our current investments in that industry? Sure. Uh, Representative Wallenhorst, apologies if I pronounced that incorrectly. But, um, so one of the things that we have done um, very intentionally over the last couple of years is to try to improve transparency as it relates to our exposure, uh, not just to fossil fuels, but we view the topic of ESG, so environmental, social, and governance issues uh, quite broadly. Um, so you'll see in the report, there is a reference to, I don't have the exact page number memorized, but there's a reference to- 127 of our slide deck. Um, there's a reference to about two point, I believe it's 2.4 or 2.5% of the endowment today uh, is exposed to fossil fuels. Um, I will defer to some members of the board or perhaps uh, SVP uh, France to, to, to talk a little bit more about some of the discussions that have been had internally. But what I will say is that there have been uh, numerous fruitful discussions to try to get a sense of what is the board's philosophy, what is the university's philosophy on, you know, what is this, this ongoing energy transition and to ensure that the uh, pools of capital that we managed are managed in a way that aligns with that mission and, and, and those values. Um, so that is, is still a work in progress in which we're having a, a lot of active dialogue now. But I don't know if, if SVP France would like to elaborate further. Senior Vice President France. Sure. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, for the question. I think one of the things that we're really uh, focused on is what we're sort of the different actions we're taking. And um, uh, Andrew's mentioned some of those, but I mean, in the last one of the intentional things we've done for a number of years, I don't know how long it was, that we stopped any active investment in fossil fuels, obviously, for some time now. But also the active investment in the ESG uh, activities in terms of environmental, social, and governance, which is really a critical opportunity for us to switch over the investments and, and become much more, to integrate those values much more in what we do, not just in the funds that we purchase, but the private investments we purchase as well. Uh, so I think one of the, our goals is to make sure as we monitor, as we monitor these investments and we work toward getting to a, a, a sustainability model that we all think are proud of and, and want to support, it, it, uh, it does take time. Some of these are legacy investments that are there that we, we try to get rid of as soon as we can. And, and you know, part of the problem is that in the last year, or so, last year or so, some of these investments grew in value in terms of the, uh, the fossil fuels because they've been doing quite well. So what you had valued has gone up in value and you're still trying to get rid of some of that. But we're actively working on how to maintain a commitment uh, in the short term to make that complete transition, but it's going to, you know, it's going to require constant attention. But I think a lot of folks don't realize the effort that goes into the, the ESG part of what we do, but and that's also consistent with what we do at the university in terms of managing our sustainability goals. What we do, how to run the university, as is equally as important as how we invest the funds that we have. So both of those elements are really critical to us. Um, I mean, I don't. I can't understate the importance we feel the need to, to uh, get toward a sustainable management of the university and an investment of the university. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further on this topic? Senior Vice President Franz, anything further on the information items? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. They're not quite as nerdy as IT, but uh, they, get, they get pretty close. Um, we, I, we do want to note there's a report 
uh, on the intent to dispose of pr property uh, that we advised the board, we talked about with the board this last summer at the um, 2050 Roselawn Avenue West and Falcon Heights. This is otherwise known as the Falcon Heights Community Park. We've been um, working with um, the Falcon Heights folks for a long time. This has been years and years and years since anything has been done relative to the university's mission there. And so we're in communication with them, but we wanted to make sure that the board is aware that we're engaged in those conversations. If they're successful, we'll come back to the board with a proposed transaction, but this is some uh, property that's located um, right at the edge of Falcon Heights and hasn't been used by the university in decades. So I wanted to make sure the board was aware of that action. And that's all I have, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, then uh, there, yep. Yes, Regent Perry. Sorry, um, I just have one item and, and really this is uh, in honor of many former regents, but one who's in the room. Uh, I just wanted to make sure we drew attention to the permanent university fund report that's in here as well that <laughs> I skipped over senior vice president Franz, um, but really wanted to highlight in there just um, the continued investment from this account into the university community vote both through uh, endowed scholarships uh, endowed research and that has just grown from 2021 to 2022 and uh, it's really nice to see that continue to provide direct benefits to the students of the University of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anything further? Then there being no additional business before the committee, we stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>